So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Introduction to Cultural Studies. Uh, we've covered quite a few texts till now. So what we'll do in this particular lecture, which will be a longish lecture, we'll have a quick summary of all the texts that we have covered so far. Uh, we'll sort of go through all the texts that we've done so far and have a general discussion on the text before we move on to the next text, which will be the final text uh, for this particular course, which is uh, Slavoj Žižek's Welcome to the Desert of the Rio. We'll also look at Dick Hebge's uh, you know, culture studies book, uh, culture studies work, one of the pioneers of culture studies uh, in a lectures to come. But before we do that, before we move to Hebjij or uh, Zizek, uh, we'll spend this particular lecture, a longish lecture, uh, having a quick summary, having a quick uh, sort of look back uh, to whatever you've done so far uh, in this uh, particular course. So just to go back at the very beginning, uh, when we set out to define culture studies, when we set out to define culture, we looked at culture as a very uh, interesting mixture, a very mutable mixture of uh, some material things, some abstract things, uh, things which are material as well as abstract, such as religion, language, race, uh, etc., uh, food. Uh, and we also looked at how culture is, one of the conditions of culture is uh, it keeps changing all the time. So uh, the coordinates of culture changes. Uh, what we call high culture, what we call low culture. I mean, these coordinates change as well. So what is uh, low culture today might become high culture tomorrow, etc. A classic case in point would be um, William Shakespeare, when, for instance, when Shakespeare's plays were originally produced way back in Elizabethan England, I mean, no one thought of those plays as um, high culture events so or high culture phenomena. Uh, they catered to um, different kinds of audiences, so they catered to the royalty, they catered to the uh, very working class people. So there's a lot of body humor in Shakespeare, as you all know. Those of you who read Shakespeare would know there are sections in Shakespeare, especially the, the comedy sections where uh, things can be quite gross and body uh, and non sophisticated. But that's actually part of the package because um, that caters to a certain kind of audience uh, who come to consume that kind of a spectacle. Uh, but yet, we look at Shakespeare today as high culture. I mean, he is, uh, his works are taught in universities across the globe, actually. Uh, we have very many seminars on Shakespeare. He keeps getting commemorated. Uh, uh, the different kinds of papers being written, different kinds of research being done. And so Shakespeare is high culture today, but you know, originally he wasn't so when his plays were produced. And you can think of many more examples such as this. So we talked about that. We talked about how culture it's a very mutable mixture. It keeps changing. It's an entanglement. Uh, it has material coordinates. It has uh, abstract coordinates. Uh, culture can become hegemonic. Culture can take up hegemonic dominant proportions. Culture can also become subversive at certain points. Uh, even within one particular culture, we can have subversive and dominant uh, coordinates, uh, discourses existing sometimes simultaneously uh, parallel to each other, etc. So we looked at how culture what we call culture is, uh, is a very complex thing, it's a very complex phenomena, and I use the word phenomena uh, quite literally. So it's something which is um, obviously constructed, something which is uh, textualized, something which works as a text, something which works as a discourse, but also there's an experiential quality about culture which we must never lose sight of. And if you remember the text that we had, uh, which kept reminding us of this, was Ian Hacking's uh, The Social Construction of What? which is a critique of the constructionist theory of culture, which sort of looks at culture just from a narrow prism of constructionist theory. And Hacking critiques that, of course, in that particular book, which is a very useful reminder, a very uh, timely reminder, because it's very easy to get seduced by this constructionist discourse, where we look at you know, every instruct, everything as a text, etc. I mean, that's, that's fine, that's true. Uh, there's a textual quality about culture as well. But it's also an experiential quality, there's a phenomenal quality about culture, which we must never lose sight of. And that particular component, that phenomenal experiential component, uh, that forms the lived reality of culture. I mean, what we call culture, the way we live culture, the way we um, embody culture, enact culture, uh, that's very, very experiential. And you know, most of the texts that we studied uh, in this particular uh, course, especially uh, texts which are essays, first-hand essays, autobiographical essays, they keep reminding us of the experientiality of culture, the phenomenal quality of culture, which can become profoundly psychological, uh, existential in its scope. So if you think of an essay such as uh, George Orwell's Shooting an Elephant, it is extremely discursive. It's something which, um, you know, it, it dramatizes discursivity, a certain kind of discursivity, the discursivity there being, uh, you know, the white man's superiority, um, the colonial mission, the colonial control mechanism, etc. But also there's an experientiality about the whole essay, about the whole experience, about the whole event. So it is a discursive as well as an experiential event. And this 
constant uh, mingling of discursivity and experientiality is what makes the essay really uh, interesting for us today, uh, shooting elephant, because, you know, and then there are questions of agency, identity, masculinity, uh, performativity, all these keep coming up in that particular essay. So, you know, that essay, along with Franz Fanon's um, essays in Black Skin, White Marks, and uh, we just completed Bell Hook's uh, essay, Understanding Patriarchy. So we see how uh, these cultural documents, I mean, one could consider these as profound cultural documents, how these cultural documents combine this element of discursivity and experientiality. And we need to look at these two categories, experientiality and discursivity, as um, complementing each other, as sort of being dialoguing with each other. So they're not necessarily uh, ontological opposites. They're not necessarily, uh, you know, undercutting each other all the time, which is a very binaristic way of looking at uh, cultural mechanisms when we say, oh, so this is a discursive bit and this is an experiential bit. Uh, we can't really map out these things uh, quite as clearly. Uh, they are constantly uh, mixing with each other and we never quite know, it's an asymmetric mixture, we never quite know uh, to what extent uh, something is discursive and to what extent something is experiential. And quality, there's a constant mixture, it's very mutable. It's a very mutable mixture and that's what uh, one of the key uh, conditions of culture, any culture for the matter. And that's something that we in cultural studies must be extremely aware of uh, when we are looking at um, these kinds of cultural texts. So uh, again, this is something we have talked about already, but one of the things about culture when we need to know is the different kinds of ways in looking at culture and cultural studies. So, so we use, for instance, uh, the prism, uh, the perspective of Marxism, uh, which is a very interesting way uh, in terms of looking at the economic entanglement of culture, uh, how every culture is economically determined. There is an ec economic base which uh, informs every culture, and out of that base, we have different kinds of superstructural coordinates such as language, religion, fashion, food, etc. Uh, so that that kind of a superstructural frame. Uh, emerges out of that economic base uh, in very interesting ways. So Marxism is a very useful way of looking at culture, especially uh, if you're looking at it from a sort of base superstructure perspective. But then again, as uh, Homi Bhava reminded us in the other question, this base superstructure uh, perspective should not become a binary. Uh, it should not become a dualistic thing where base and superstructure are ontologically different. So we have many instances where base and superstructure keep reversing uh, and they keep mingling with each other and we never quite know what is base and what is superstructure. And one particular phenomenon can inhabit uh, both these categories quite easily and quite complexly. So Marxism is a very useful way of looking at culture. Psychology is a very useful way of looking at culture because one of the key conditions of culture is appropriation. Uh, so we use the word appropriation in different kinds of ways. Uh, appropriation is discursive, so you discursively appropriate something. Uh, you appropriate certain codes of behavior, codes of contact, uh, sartorial codes, gastronomic codes, etc., linguistic codes. But also mm, appropriation can be a profoundly psychological phenomenon because it's also part of um, internalization. You're internalizing certain coordinates, you're internalizing certain isms, certain ideology, and that process is quite uh, psychological. So again, it's quite experiential in quality. So discursivity, experientiality go hand in hand when we talk about something such as appropriation, which is uh, perhaps the most important verb when you look at culture and culture studies, appropriation. Uh, we are constantly appropriating things. Uh, we are appropriating language, we are appropriating idioms, uh, we are appropriating certain cultural coordinates, we are appropriating uh, certain, um, you know, kinds of agentic coordinates, etc. So appropriation is a very useful, a very important term in cultural studies. And connected to appropriation is a question of agency. Uh, again, this question keeps coming up throughout uh, this particular course, as I'm sure all of you are aware of. Um, you know, all the texts we've studied that more or less talk about agency in some form or the other. So when you talk about something like Orwell's um, essay, Shooting an Elephant, uh, that, that essay becomes a very interesting description, uh, a very paradoxical drama of agency in the sense that uh, the person with notionally agentic self, the person who is notionally agentic, most agentic, uh, most privileged uh, and agentic, turns out to be the most agency less in the end. So uh, agency again, uh, like culture, is a very mutable category. So it can appear full as well as empty at the same time. So uh, I mean, in the case of that particular essay, Orwell's um, Shooting an Elephant, what we see in the end of the essay is a liquidation of agency. So it's an exhaustion of agency. The person loses agency and uh, just has to enact uh, the particular duty expected of him, the particular cultural appropriation expected of him as a white man in a colonial uh, setting. Uh, 
although notionally he is the most agentic person in the entire drama, so he has notionally, theoretically, uh, the most uh, agency in that particular setting, but at the same time he loses agency because he has agency. So the question of power also comes into being quite clearly. Uh, and we have read Foucault, uh, what is an author, where he talks about it's very interesting. Uh, he offers a very discursive analysis of the question of authority, power, authorship, etc., which become very important points in, in cultural studies. Uh, but then again, each of these categories, power, authority, authorship, agency, these are very mutabilities. So mutability is one of the constants of culture, uh, you might say. Uh, every culture is mutable, every cultural coordinate is mutable. So agency, power, authority, these are cultural coordinates and these are mutable. Mutability becomes the key condition for each of these coordinates at any given point of time. So um, one of the things which we also were mindful of in this course was the historical frame of any culture. So we can't study any particular cultural phenomenon by divorcing it from a historical frame. So historicity uh, is a very important uh, condition for cultural studies. We must locate the event within that particular historical frame. So when we're looking at Franz Fanon's Black School word marks, we are looking at a historical frame of French Algerian colonial conditions. Uh, and, and if you take it out of the frame uh, and you know, look at it from a macro perspective, a neutral perspective, you lose out on the nitty gritty of what is being said by Fano, we lose out on the cultural specificity that a particular essay demands as a text. So when I look at Fano's black skin white marks, we see how the body becomes very important. Uh, the black body becomes uh, a, a very discursive design uh, in a certain uh, certain condition. Uh, it is racialized, epidermalized, as Fano says. So this entire process of uh, epidermalization, where you become something because of your skin color, uh, is a very massive phenomenon in black skin white marks. The great title suggests that it's an act of appropriation, a constant act of appropriation that you do as a black person in France. You have a black skin, but they put on a white mask in order to sort of appropriate a certain kind of agency, a certain kind of privilege that is only accorded uh, to the uh, white population. And of course, that appropriation uh, can only be a misappropriation, can only be an inadequate appropriation, as Fano keeps reminding us. So for instance, if, uh, I mean, there are many instances in that particular book, I'm sure you remember, where Fano says that when a black person speaks very fluent French, uh, the obvious question that comes to him is, how did you pick up French so well? How did you speak French so well? Uh, the obvious assumption is the black person should not be able to, the black, black person should not be able to speak French in the first place. So any act of speaking French must be an act of inadequate appropriation. And that, that constructed quality about appropriation is never lost sight of. However, there are certain other constructed qualities which are um, sort of very conveniently effaced away. The white man's domination, the white man's superiority, I mean these are more uh, heavily constructed categories, but that, that particular construct is very easily and effectively effaced away. And no one asks those questions that how come the white man becomes superior in the first place. So these questions remain unasked, whereas the question of the black man's appropriation are heavily and massively asked throughout uh, the colonial setting. So black skin white marks become quite interestingly uh, uh, a very good example of psychological uh, drama, psychological trauma in the colonial setting, where this constant act, this constant anxiety to appropriate becomes a condition uh, for the colonized person, for the colonized subject, uh, seeking to appropriate a certain cultural coordinates, which uh, you know, are markers of privilege, agency, and authority. So that's a very important text that we uh, studied extensively for this particular course. And in a very interesting way, it's dialoguing with uh, uh, Orwell's Shooting the Elephant, uh, because in that essay, Orwell is talking about the crisis of being a white man, where there's also an act of appropriation demanded of the white man. So there are certain structural similarities that you can find between the Orwell essay and the Fano book, uh, Black Skin, White Marks, although they belong to different cultural conditions. And uh, the speaking subject is very different. So for Orwell, it's a white man who is notionally, theoretically agentic. Uh, and for Fano, it's a black man who is constantly um, you know, anxious to appropriate the cultural, the proper coordinates of culture, the proper agentic coordinates, which will give, up, give him or confer privilege onto him. So, uh, and then we look at something like uh, Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, which is a very profoundly uh, postmodernist and post-structuralist way of looking at culture and cultural appropriation, especially when it comes to gender. Uh, so gender uh, for Butler becomes a verb, 
uh, an act of becoming, an act of becoming, unbecoming, rebecoming, etc. And there's a textual quality about gender, but also and equally there's a phenomenal uh, and experiential quality about gender that Butler never loses sight of. So, I mean, this is what Hacking talks about when uh, he appreciates Butler and says that Butler actually makes an effort to move away from a purely constructionist perspective and offer a more experiential perspective, a more complex perspective, which takes into account the entire phenomenon of becoming and unbecoming and rebecoming uh, when it comes to gender identity. So, gender trouble, especially if you remember the sections on the drag, the sections on performativity, the section on, you know, parody and pastiche that we studied quite uh, extensively, uh, those become very important sections, very uh, alive and animated sections which help us in terms of understanding how gender is configured, reconfigured and deconfigured um, in different kinds of cultural settings. So, gender trouble becomes a phenomenal, a seminal text uh, for understanding of cultural appropriation through uh, act of gendering and regendering and degendering. So, the entire verb quality of gender is something that Butler uh, constantly highlights. And that's what makes that particular text profoundly post-structuralist in quality. So it's a it's a book where uh, you know it draws on post-structuralism, it draws on post-modernism, and looks at real cultural phenomena such as gender, gendering, etc. And the classifications that come, uh, you know, therein, uh, the classifications that are accorded to certain kinds of gendered behavior. Right. So now, when you look at post-modernism, I just mentioned post-modernism. So it's a good time to also mention Lyotard. Uh, whose book, uh, The Postmodern Condition, is something that we dealt with extensively in this particular course. So, that, that book, The Postmodern Condition, is a really a prophetic book in the sense that it looks at the nature of knowledge, uh, how knowledge changes for the postmodern condition, how knowledge becomes more micro in quality, where uh, the public space disappears um, um, entirely, and what we have instead are different kinds of micro uh, public spaces where language games are enacted. Uh, and in a way, it's a very prophetic uh, essay because that's exactly what we experience today. There is no public space in a proper sense of the word. Uh, what we have instead are different virtual micro spaces which can trigger conversations, which can trigger dialogues, which can trigger uh, controversies, uh, and which can become vital in quality. And the word vital is, is quite important because that has a, a slightly pathological quality about it. But when we use the word vital for virtual reality, when you use the word vital for social media today, we don't necessarily make it. Uh, it can often come with a positive connotation, a positive attribute. Something goes vital means something becomes phenomenally popular, something gets spread across communities. It's like a spread of a disease, but it could be a good disease. It could be a good knowledge disease where people get to know certain things. Uh, but it's a very interesting entanglement of a negative pathological connotation uh, and a positive informative uh, connotation. So, these two kinds of connotative categories, uh, connotative registers keep getting mixed uh, in the word vital and that's something that uh, Lyotard seems to anticipate in a postmodern condition. But apart from that, it's also a very important book uh, to look at science, to look at how science becomes discursive and how uh, the nature of science changes with the postmodern condition, where the entire miniaturization of machines, our machines become miniaturized, become more and more micro, uh, more and more metonymic in quality. And this entire uh, metonymization of machines, entire miniaturization of machines becomes part of the postmodern condition for Lyotard. Now, it's a very important book to understand postmodernism, and it draws on literary examples as well. So, the, those of us who are from literary backgrounds would find the book extremely useful and helpful uh, because towards the end of the book, if you remember, it gives a contrast, it offers a contrast between Joyce and Proust, and it talks about how in Proust there is this residual lingering uh, of a narrative um, architecture. But when it comes to Joyce, especially when it comes to Finnegan Swake, uh, he does away with the narrative architecture altogether and offers a very postmodernist uh, kind of a formative architecture. And he ends with a very important note when he says that postmodernism is something which actually comes before modernism. So, postmodernism is something which is constantly formative. So, in that sense, it's a style which will never go out, which will never end. It's not really a temporal category per se. It's more of a stylistic category for Lyotard, where he says that, you know, anything which comes before the modern is actually postmodern, before anything becomes fossilized into a form, fossilized into a structure. That act of finding a structure, the act of finding a form, that is what postmodernism is all about. Uh, the act of searching for a form, the act of looking for a form, uh, that is postmodernism or postmodernist aesthetics. Uh, for Lyotard. So, in a way, it's a very, very useful book for culture studies as well as for literary studies and 
and those of us interested in postmodernism as a movement, as a cultural phenomenon. So that is one of the seminal books that we have covered, uh, hopefully with some degree of attention uh, for this particular course. Now there is a series of other texts that we have covered uh, and for instance, we just finished looking at Bell Hooks uh, Understanding Patriarchy, which like Butler, like Fano, like Orwell, uh, constantly highlights the experientiality of uh, patriarchy or being subjected to patriarchy, being uh, sort of a sufferer under patriarchy. And more interestingly, it moves away from this battlefield of binaries, moves away from this man versus woman uh, kind of a binary which looks at men being the oppressors and women being the victims of patriarchy. It moves away from this blunt binaristic understanding of patriarchy. It looks at patriarchy as a system, as a discursive experiential social system which uh, finds its collaborators uh, and uh, finds its uh, participants among men as well as women and uh, Hooks talks about quite clearly she talks about how uh, it's not really biologically determined uh, patriarchy is a system is a cultural system is a constructed system which becomes experiential and quality due to acts of internalization due to little rituals of internalization but the point to remember that you know, that uh, Hooks constantly reminds us is the fact that it's a system which is uh, con constructed and participated and consumed by men as well as women. Uh, so if we are to question patriarchy, we must take a more collaborative approach. So Hooks appears quite critical of those brands of feminism which looks at men as enemies, which looks at uh, which look at men as uh, the the other, uh, as someone outside uh, the movement of patriarchy. So patriarchy, if it is to be dismantled, if it is to be deconstructed uh, as a system, as a text, as a narrative, as an experience, as a social phenomenon, uh, then we must be uh, together at this. We must look at how men suffer patriarchy as well, uh, how men who abuse uh, you know, the enti entire idea of patriarchy, how they were abused in their own terms, how this entire idea of uh, psychologization affects men quite profoundly when they become perpetrators of patriarchy as well. So even victims of patriarchy as well as perpetrators of patriarchy, they are psychologically uh, sort of affected by patriarchy and, and, and Hooks makes quite clear the patriarchy is a disease. So she talks about the pathological quality about patriarchy, how you know there's a pathologization which happens due to acts of internalization. So when you internalize something, you become pathologized by patriarchy. So in that sense, patriarchy is a disease, it's a social disease which must be critiqued. But in order to critique it, we must address the question, uh, you know, the question of patriarchy, which goes beyond uh, the binary of men versus women. And that's something that Hooks constantly reminds us. So one of the things which you may have noticed in this particular course is that most of the thinkers that we have, most of the texts that we have studied, uh, they tend to move away, they tend to advocate a non-binaristic understanding of culture, non-binaristic understanding of gender, power, authority, etc. And instead of a more, uh, uh, a more collaborative, a more entangled, a more dialectical approach to these things. So that's one of the key things that in cultural studies we must remind ourselves constantly. Uh, if we fall in the trap of binary, if we fall in the trap of the dualistic understanding of uh, how power works, how nature works, how culture works, how uh, patriarchy works, how language works, then we end up replicating those power structures. We end up replicating those patriarchal, phallocentric, uh, discursive structures which are designed to promote certain orders of humans above and uh, above certain others. So for instance, uh, that's a critique that Homi Baba does to Edward Said when he says Said's understanding of Orientalism uh, is, is phenomenal, is one of the seminal understandings of uh, the entire idea of colonialism, etc. But there's a theoretical fallacy in Said, there's a theoretical error that Said never quite gets over uh, from, and that is the error of binary. So he looks at uh, the entire Orient versus Occident as a binary, which doesn't quite move, which doesn't quite uh, come into collusion uh, or collision. So this entire idea of collusion and collision is something that uh, Bhava is extremely important, extremely uh, interested in as a post-structuralist. So he is more interested in looking at how authority, power, these things can become uh, quite collusive in quality, how the colonizer as well as the colonizer can participate and co-consume uh, these things in different degrees. So this entire idea of co-consumption becomes important because when you take that theory of Bhava and put it into over shooting elephant with the entire essay becomes an act of co-consumption. Right. It's not just the colonizer consuming power or authority, it's also the colonized who becomes consumer of that same kind of authority, same kind of patriarchal, expansionist, imperialist enterprise and how uh, you know, that narrative is set out for everyone uh, to co-consume. Right. And that therein lies the, uh, the real rich quality in Bauer's essay where he offers this very poor structuralist uh, idea of power authority, especially in a colonial setting. So 
And then we did something like Hannah Arendt's uh, The Human Condition, which is a very uh, important text in terms of looking at labor, work, power, and also the idea of public space and private space. So the entire idea of the private space becoming more important than the public space is something that Arendt keeps talking about throughout this book. And that we can connect that to the idea of public space and private space uh, at the end of Lyotard's The Postmodern Condition, where he takes up the picks a bone with uh, Eugen Habermas and his Habermasian understanding of public space, which uh, Lyotard critiques, because according to Lyotard, that understanding of public space, it presupposes a certain kind of unity it privileges a certain kind of unity, a certain kind of narrative, which can quickly become hegemonic in quality. And the whole idea, the whole business of postmodernism, if it may be considered to be a business in very banal terms, uh, is to critique that kind of a hegemonization, that kind of a uh, dominant discursive formation, which can quickly uh, you know, extend from this heavy Muslim understanding of the public sphere, according to Lyotard. Okay, so you know these are many texts that we have covered in the particular in this particular course, and of course, uh, I mean we talked about different kinds of theoretical frameworks, how uh, the different theoretical frameworks can fit into this course, uh, how as um, um, a study as as a branch of study, culture studies is uh, essentially uh, interdisciplinary in quality. We draw on different kinds of disciplines: uh, psychology, uh, language studies, uh, gender studies, uh, literary studies. Um, you know, colonial studies, etc., feminism. So all these things come into play uh, very, very richly in cultural studies and make it a course, make it something which we can relate to in our real lives. So that's one of the key things that I would like you to take uh, from this particular course. And of course, we'll have one more course, one more text to finish after this, uh, where we look at uh, the very postmodern condition, uh, post 9-11, uh, how 9-11 constantly uh, reminds us of this borderland in Samuel Krum, and how that particular Samuel Krum becomes a spectacle, not just of consumption, but of phobia. And that this interesting uh, entanglement of phobia and spectacle, phobia and consumption, where you not just become traumatized, you become a traumatophilic, uh, in quality, you, you love trauma, you love to consume trauma. It's something which Zizek talks about quite extensively uh, in um, uh, Welcome to the Desert of the Real, which, which is obviously an allusion to the Matrix movies. If you've seen the Matrix movies, um, those are films which constantly question this uh, borderline between reality and virtuality. I never quite know when uh, reality ends and the virtual world begins, so everything can be virtual, everything can be real at any given point of time, and that neat mapping uh, is almost impossible in the world we live in today. So, you know, so we can see Zizek extending the Lyotardian understanding of postmodernism in uh, slightly more dystopian ways, perhaps. But that's, uh, again, a very real condition. That's a condition we can readily relate to in the way we live our world today. So, you know, this overview, the summary that I just tried to offer you today in this particular lecture uh, is hopefully helpful in terms of looking at how uh, we look at culture studies, how we ought to look at culture studies as a real phenomenon, not just as a text, not just as an um, academic enterprise, but as something which we can relate to in our daily lives in quite readily in more ways than one. And again, uh, just going back to some of the key texts that we have studied uh, for this particular course. So when you look at Orwell, when you look at Pava, when you look at Hannah Arendt, uh, Bell Hooks, um, you know, uh, Foucault, uh, Lyotard, uh, and, and series of other things, uh, other texts and figures that we constantly have uh, alluded to, uh, it's very easy, and I mentioned again, it's very easy to be seduced away by the grand narrative of constructionist theory. And th this is a paradox so you must be uh, slightly comic in a way. Uh, that we must be quite aware of. We're constantly looking at the textuality of culture. We're constantly questioning uh, the constructed quality of culture. There is this uh, tendency, there is this danger, there's this risk of reification, which can operate in a reverse way, that we say that everything is textualized, everything is constructed, and we can't really think in terms of any other prism, any other perspective. And that is exactly where Jan Hacking's book, uh, the social construction of what comes in very, very handy. It's an ex extremely important book which constantly reminds us that in this entire idea of this construction history where we look at everything as a construct is a fallacy because that does away with the experientiality, with the robust and rich understanding of culture as a phenomenon, as a lived experience, as something which you viscerally live, uh, you inhabit, you internalize, you psychologize, you suffer. Uh, you're affected by. And if you're looking at everything as a text, as a dry text, as a dry uh, textual hermeneutics, then obviously you are doing a disservice uh, to the entire phenomenon of culture. So this phenomenality of culture is something that we need to be very, very constantly aware of.
the phenomenality and the textuality, like I said a little while ago, they are not ontological opposites. They don't undercut each other. They complement each other. They supplement each other in more ways than one, especially when looking at culture as a complex phenomenon. Right, so this is uh, what we have covered so far. This is the uh, sort of the inherent fundamental message that one may draw from this particular course. Uh, this is the, the takeaway from the course, as you will, if you will. Uh, and of course, the different texts do it differently. The different texts we've covered for this particular course have different takes on culture, but they seem to they seem to be a commonality. And I've been quite uh, sort of plan. I've been quite uh, careful in terms of selecting the text because you know there's a commonality, there's a thread that we can see connecting all those texts in terms of how these texts are looking at this entanglement of discursivity and experientiality as a very complex phenomenon, right? And not relying just on one and uh, disregarding the other. So, for instance, when you look at Bell Hooks essay, Understanding Patriarchy, it's quite anecdotal in quality. It constantly draws on personal experiences, personal trauma, personal memory, personal encounters. But at the same time, it keeps locating those encounters, locating those events in a bigger narrative of culture, the bigger narrative of patriarchy, uh, which is particular essay, you know, Understanding Patriarchy, sets out to define, describe, and dismantle. Uh, as Franz Fanon's Black Skin White Marx is a profoundly personal essay. It draws on autobiographical elements, it draws on different kinds of experiences that the person, the subject has had in uh, different colonial conditions. However, those experiences are lo located and mapped onto this um, entire discursive phenomenon of colonialism, which never lost sight of. So again, we're looking at this very interesting balance between uh, the experientiality, the lived reality, and the textual discursivity, which constitutes culture. And this is something which we uh, must be uh, constantly aware of because, you know, cultural studies is not just a textbook, it's not just an academic enterprise, it's not just a classroom. It's something that we live, inhabit, consume, breathe every day, whether we're aware of it or not. And this particular course, uh, in a way, is a very modest attempt to make us aware of uh, how culture happens, how culture takes place, how culture is internalized, how the culture coordinates change. And you know, change is something that we must be uh, constantly mindful of, especially when we look at culture studies as a spectrum uh, that we, uh, you know, a series of texts, events, phenomena, reality, virtuality, etc., that we're interested in as scholars and students of this particular discipline. So, with that, I conclude this particular lecture and move on uh, to Slavoj Žižek's Welcome to the Desert of the Rio in the next lecture, which should be our final text for this course. And then we'll spend some time looking at Dick Hedges' uh, understanding culture studies because that's one of the pioneer uh, sort of studies in culture or culture studies, one of the uh, seminal, you know, uh, texts, one of the seminal uh, scholarship, really, on culture studies that we must be aware of before we wind up this particular course. So, thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.